from New York City. For our viewers worldwide, I'm Katie Greifeld. Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, a pickup in unemployment gives a gift to bond bulls, only to see yields reverse after strong ISM manufacturing figures, with Wall Street saying the Fed can pause from here. We begin with the big issue, the Fed's Goldilocks moment. The kind of Goldilocks scenario that the Fed wants. The Goldilocks number. Labor markets are normalizing. Federal Reserve, it's a, it's a pretty good report. I mean, That's great news. A little bit uh, less wage pressure, which is good from the Fed's perspective. Wages coming down is significant. Softening in wage gains. That stubbornly low unemployment rate finally ticking up. Greater labor force participation. Working in the direction that the Fed wanted to go. Everything is looking like it's moving in the right direction. The Fed is going to say this is clearly a labor market that is rebalancing. The labor market can be a real slippery slope. The Fed's looking so carefully at the data. Is this the data point that Fed needs? It's about restrictive policy for longer, not higher for longer. Read what the underlying uh, trend is in data. Follow the labor market. The Fed that is likely to uh, press the pause button on the rate hiking cycle. I think the Fed should be done. Joining us now, Marianne Bartels of Sanctuary Wealth and Columbia Threadneedles' Ed Al-Husseini. And Ed, since you're sitting next to me on set, I'll give you the first question. Let's talk about the price action this morning. We got the jobs report, unemployment rate finally coming up, two-year Treasury yield goes 10 basis points lower. We get that ISM manufacturing figure. Now we're three basis points higher. Talk us through that round trip and what's the right read from the numbers we got today? Well, first it's the last Friday in August, so let's be careful. Mm -hmm. uh, not a ton of liquidity. Uh, but the fundamental issue here is the market trying to find an equilibrium around where the Fed is going to be next year. Um, I think the question around this year, really we're micromanaging this probability of an additional hike. In my mind, yes, there's a pretty good reason to hike one more time. Um, that's decently getting priced in. The question is how much space there is for easing next year. And the data in aggregate right now doesn't give the Fed a lot of room relative to market pricing. So we're seeing that market pricing get taken out. Marianne, let's come to you on that issue. When you think about what the, the market is priced for and what we're hearing from the Fed, how much distance do you think there is between those two? Well, I think everyone is trying to figure out where the Fed is, and we've been trying to figure that out all year, and we've had a hard time. The market has had a hard time figuring it out. I still think that there's a distance. I do think that there is a camp that can argue that the Fed should pause and, and stay on hold, and there is a camp that they may have to raise rates. Uh, you know, don't forget that we're recently in the middle of wage negotiations with significant higher wages. So although we saw a tick down in wages, does that mean the data going forward, if we're getting higher wages in other pockets of the economy, does that mean it's actually really, you know, you know, bottom. So mm. I, I, I'm still suspect. And I think rates are moving today. Yes, the data is mixed, but rates from a technical perspective are extremely oversold. And I think that can argue that they can rally. They're holding key technical levels. Mm -hmm. And I'm still in the camp that we have not peaked in rates. I still think that there is a risk at some point, whether it's later this year or next year, that the Fed may have to raise one more time. Marianne, I'm so happy you brought up the strikes. And let's talk a little bit more about that because it was interesting. Within this data uh, from the BLS, we learned that the film industry, in terms of payrolls there, fell by 17,000. You look at trucking payrolls, fell 37,000. How noisy is the data that we got today? And how noisy could it get when we think about the impact of these strikes and those wage negotiations? Well, that's why you want to use moving averages whenever you're looking at any data, because any data point is not a direction. Uh, you want to smooth things out to really get a trend. And I don't think in most of the data that we have that we have a very clear picture, which is why the market is having a hard time trying to actually find where the, where the Fed is. And, and don't forget, Powell was very clear, and I think this was a very important Last Jackson Hole last year, he opened up that he was going to keep at it. This Jackson Hole, he closed 
that the Fed will keep at it. I think that was a very strong signal that they're data dependent and they're not afraid to continue to raise rates if they need to. Mm -hmm. And Ed, you heard Marianne bring up the point that rates look oversold here. And there's a really interesting debate about duration going on. We actually heard from Ian Lingen of BMO and BlackRock's Jeff Rosenberg on that debate. Let's take a listen. The 10-year Treasury, in my mind, is a screaming buy. I think that we do get 10-year yields back to 3%. I don't think it happens this year. I think that that will be a first half of 2024 event. I think that the screaming buy is the two-year. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, because I think there you have the best combination of yield and the exposure, as we're seeing in today's market reaction, to changes in this kind of normalization. That is the part of the yield curve where uh, I think you're going to have the best risk reward in terms of owning duration. All right, Ed, we've got the Ian Lingen view. We've got the Jeff Rosenberg view. Where's the screaming buy in Ed Hal Husseini's minds? Oh, man, uh, I'm very tempted to split the difference and say the intermediate part of the curve <laughs> is, is, is pretty good. And I really think, look, the, the intermediate part of the curve, both in terms of real rate valuation, is quite attractive. It gets you a little bit away from some of the debate that we're having at the very front end of the curve in terms of, look, how much hiking is there left to do, how much easing uh, will the Fed have room to do next year. The intermediate part of the curve, I think, does offer some value. The curve is inverted. Uh, we think that the curve will steepen out, uh, and that really benefits that intermediate part uh, uh, most aggressively. But I have to say, uh, you know, most of the screaming this year has come <laughs> from bond investors. Um, and so uh, clearly the curve hasn't found an equilibrium yet. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the intermediate part of the curve. Can we call it the belly? Is it safe to call it the belly? Let's call it the belly. All right, let's talk about the belly and the love for the belly. What's going to drive it there? Is that a bet on basically rate cuts in the next five years or so? Um, think about it this way. There's sort of three pathways to a steeper curve that would benefit the, that intermediate to front part of the curve. One is a recession. Of course, the Fed will be under a lot of pressure to cut rates in that environment. Two is inflation coming down, and that's really been the story of this year. Mm. The key story has been inflation has come down much faster uh, than the Fed anticipated, and I think than market participants anticipated. The third part of the story is a steeper curve led by long ends moving higher. Mm. Uh, and that really damages the 10 and 30 year part of the curve. That's the economy repricing to a higher neutral. That's the economy repricing to an environment where we can sustain higher rates and we get generate growth, which again has been the story of this year. Mm -hmm. So I think the intermediate part of the curve kind of captures uh, the best risk reward between those three scenarios. And Marianne, come in on that. You did make the point again that rates look oversold here. When you look across the curve though, where do you see the most dislocation? Where do you see the most opportunity? So I would agree with the, the two speakers. I, we're doing more of a barbell. We're, we like the front end and we like the back end and we don't like the belly. So <laughs> we would balance, so we would balance between the short end and, and, and the long end. But I'll tell you something that, that keeps me concerned about fixed income. Uh, when we look at sentiment surveys and how fund managers are saying that they're positioned in fixed income, especially relative to equities, we have an overweight in fixed income and underweight in equities. And my experience has been when you deal with sentiment of that kind of extreme, it has to flip flop. So the risk is, is that something negative happens in fixed income and something positive happens on the equity side. So I still think we're going to have a lot of volatility in uh, fixed income. If you look at the move, uh, ICE uh, via the uh, volatility index for fixed income, it remains elevated and much more elevated than the volatility than we're actually seeing in uh, the equity market. And let's also not forget the banks and the unrealized uh, losses that they have. And if rates continue to go up, that's going to be problematic. And something that we watch are called relative ratios. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll take a stock price and look at it relative to the S&P. Citibank, a money center bank, just recently traded at an all-time relative new low, below where it was in 2008 and 2009. Mm -hmm. That is just shocking. 
So I think the banks are going to play a very key and pivotal role in where we're going in the fixed income markets eventually. Well, Ed, on the topic of the banks, you think about some of those small and mid-sized lenders. One of the big problems there is they're going to have to pay up for deposits. And you take a look at money market funds, I believe, hitting a fresh record in the week just past, nearly $5.6 trillion in money market funds. If we continue to see that flow of cash, and it remains to be seen whether that's coming out of deposits or simply a safe haven trade, what's the pressure on the banks? Well, in my mind, the key pressure right now is their capacity to raise additional capital. So we're seeing issuance go up. I think the good news is we have a lot of capacity to absorb that issuance in investment grade capital markets. So um, banks are going to very likely shrink their loan books, raise additional capital, and be quite conservative going into 2024. And in some ways, from a financial stability perspective, that's exactly the mode that we want them in. Um, you know, one of the surprises, obviously, this year has been the economy in some ways has accelerated, despite the fact that lending conditions have tightened at, mm -hmm. at the bank level. That tells me that some of the bank lending is being intermediated away from them, mm. uh, private credit, et cetera, et cetera. And so the longer term story for them is, how do we maintain a business model where we're being eaten away uh, from very aggressive competitors? A good note to end on, a really tricky existential moment for these banks. Marianne Bartels and Ed Al, Al Husseini, thank you both so much. Really enjoyed this conversation. Up next, it's the auction block. LVMH helps European issuance close out August in style. That's coming up next. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Katie Greifeld. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Time now for the auction block where it was completely dead over here in the U.S. this week. Meanwhile, there was plenty of action, though, in Europe where we saw around 35 billion euros of sales highlighted by names like Volkswagen, LVMH and Caterpillar. The region had the second highest August sales level in 10 years. Looking ahead to sales for September in the U.S., banks that underwrite the bonds expect about $120 billion to be issued, much more than the $78 billion sold last September. And checking out the month's forecast for high yield and leverage loans, we should see a pickup of more than $15 billion. That is much more compared to pandemic years, but falls way short compared to 2019, which had a roughly $60 billion pipeline. Speaking of high yield, Michael Kantopoulos of Richard Bernstein has his doubts. Corporate credit just looks way too rich. Um, I just don't see the benefit of owning, whether it's high yield or investment grade, corporate credit here. Uh, spreads are so tight, you're not compensated for any sort of uncertainty. And as rates continue to go higher and companies need to refinance, obviously that's happening all the time, the loan market as rates flow. But in the high yield market, as basically you know, companies come to, to, to market and issue new debt with much higher interest costs, unless their earnings are accelerating to a much higher degree than rates are going up, there's going to be a lot of pain in high yield. Joining us now, I'm thrilled to say we have Schwab's Colin Martin and Tom Tesoris of Strategus, a Baird company. Joining me both on set on a summer Friday, which is a particular treat. Let's start with you, Colin, on that point that Mike Kentopoulos made. When you look at spreads right now, I'm looking at, what, 120 on investment grade, about 370 on junk bond spreads. Is that too rich against this economic backdrop? It is too rich, and, and I share a lot of the same concerns, although we are more positive on investment grade. But with high yield, coming into the year, there, there were a handful of indicators we were looking at that are still ringing true today that suggest spreads should be a lot higher, and it just hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the performances here, it shouldn't be too surprising. I mean, stocks are up so much, and they're both risk assets. Also, you have the whole soft landing idea. But if you have an inverted yield curve, you have banks tightening credit standards, and then if you have spreads so low, as you mentioned, 3.7%, we just don't think it makes too much sense. Given how high yields are across the country, across the globe, why take so much risk when mm. you can get four, five, five and a half percent with investment grade rated issuers? Or with cash, I'm not sure. Uh, Tom, come in on that point though, because Colin mentioned performance. I like to look at ETFs in particular. And if you look at popular tickers like JNK and HYG, they're sitting on total returns of 7%, 6%. 
they've seen enormous outflows all year. And really, as a category, you've just seen high yield uh, bond ETFs just shed billions of dollars. Why aren't flows following performance? Is this a valuation story? Well, I think very much like you saw in the equity markets of the, over the last two decades, you saw the depublicization of the equity market. You're seeing public credit markets also generally shrinking relative mm. to the private credit market. So yes, you're seeing outflows from the broadly traded pr public credit market indicators like uh, high yield ETFs, but credit liquidity is flowing in from, it was mentioned by an earlier guest, private credit uh, direct lenders. And that is helping to kind of stem some of the, 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 the stress that's building. But the big picture, I would, I would echo uh, Colin's comments here, that simply put, we're too tight on the IG side, even if there's no recession, by maybe 10 to 20 basis points, and if there's a recession, probably 80 to 100 basis points. Huh. And on the high yield side, we're, we're even more egregiously mispriced, in my opinion. Even if there's no recession, we're probably 100 to 150 basis points too tight on the high yield side. I want to get to private credit, but you brought up some specific levels. Colin, I'm curious if you have any levels in mind that would be closer to fair value. Yeah, I think a lot higher than they are now. If we look at historical or even just over the past 10 or 15 years, how high have spreads gotten in periods of slower economic growth or just general market volatility, you tend to see spreads in the 7 or 8% range. And we're only at you know 3.7. Doesn't mean we'll necessarily get there now. I think the, the market dynamics have changed a bit. You mentioned private, so I won't get into that. The size <laughs> of the market has shrunk. There's a lot of things out there. So we think it's probably a lot higher than it is right now. And we wouldn't be surprised if, if high yield got to 55 or 6% in the next 6 or 12 months. Feels a long way away right now. But let's talk a little bit more about private credit because, Tom, it feels like it's eating everything. Yep. And right now, no one really knows how large this market is. Even the amount of, of assets that are under management, dry powder, there's a lot of ambiguity there. What we can say is it's large. It is probably rivaling in size the high yield market itself and potentially rivaling in size the high yield market plus the bank loan space, depending on how much there is in the pipeline coming from, we'll call it pension funds that could come in and actually continue to increase allocations. So we're talking, reasonably speaking, somewhere around $2 trillion in size with something on the order of $400 billion to $500 billion of dry powder. That appears to be the case right now. Now, that's not going to keep spreads from widening if there's a recession in the high yield space, but that is certainly adequate to keep spreads spreads anchored where they are right now while stress is not apparent. Colin, should I be scared? <laughs> should you be scared? I, I don't think so for now. Things are looking okay. If we look at defaults, for example, and this is something that we've been paying attention to, defaults have been picking up. And they're probably picking up in the private markets. We just don't know because we can't really see the data. But in the public markets, they are. But they're not surging higher. It's kind of a gradual increase, kind of just back, back to long-term averages. We think as time passes, though, it's the higher for longer and just the impact of these higher rates. What does that mean on, on these companies' bottom lines? If you look at loans and a lot of companies that private credit is lending to, with floating rate coupons, they've seen their interest expense, their annual interest expense, more than double over the mm -hmm. past 12 months. How can you sustain that for the next 12 months in an environment when corporate profits are slowing? So, so we do think that's a big risk right now. What does this mean for bank business models? I mean, we were just discussing in the last segment the, the, the really absorption of funds going into money market funds, maybe coming from bank deposits. And then you have private credit also booming uh, just to make matters a little bit trickier. Tom, what does this mean for financial, this, both the sector and the debt? Well, I think what this means is for the banks that their business model continues to be one that's going to be under pressure from regulatory attack. And it means that there's going to be more of an emphasis on, we'll say, fee-based income, um, um, fines, for, you know, penalties for their clients, things like that, as opposed to a lending pipeline. And what lending pipeline is going to be in existence two, three, five years from now is going to very much be a lend to securitize mm. type of model. And that means it's going to favor the larger lenders, scale, size is going to be, we've heard this story before over the last decade. I don't think that changes. So it means that the regional banks are going to continue to be under a regulatory pressure and, and uh, competitive pressure from all different angles. That, I think that's the case we're looking at. And I don't think that's uh, particularly surprising given what uh, we've seen so far. 
I mean, we could keep this conversation going for an hour probably, but I only have two minutes left with you guys. So I want to talk a little bit more about levels before I let you go. Uh, there was an interesting quote uh, from Cameron Dawson uh, on television, I think it was yesterday, talking about basically if we saw 10-year yields go back to 3%, and there have been some calls for that, that would be a screaming sell for credit, which I thought was interesting. And I'm curious, Colin, what would be more painful for the corporate credit market at this juncture? Would it be 10-year yields going to 3% or to 5%? <laughs> That's a good way of framing it. I'd say to 5% because then you have that all-in cost in an environment that we, th we, we still think is, is slowing. If the economy does slow and inflation re remains sticky, that's a problem for corporations. Now, on the flip side, though, not to kind of play both sides, if we go down to 3% on the 10-year Treasury, that's not happening for good reasons. The Fed would be cutting in that instance, mm -hmm. and again, not for good reason. So both would be relatively bad, but, but our main theme and what we're telling all our clients at Schwab is to focus on quality. Regardless of either outcome, it's those junky companies that are at most at risk right now. And Tom, we have about 30 seconds. What's scarier, 3% or 5%? Uh, I would agree 5%. But what you've just highlighted is really that when you are an investor, let's say in a triple C credit, your short yield volatility, that is, if you get big jumps or big drops in, say, the 10-year yield or the five-year yield, you are going to see spreads widen out for multiple reasons. And that exactly illustrates just that problem. But I'd say 5% is the place I would really be worried about. Well, this Treasury market has been defined by volatility. So uh, sounds like pretty fun dynamic. Guys, we got to leave it there. Really enjoyed this. My thanks to Colin, Martin, and Tom Tesouris. Still ahead, it's the final spread. The week ahead, Fed speak picking up again. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Katie Greifeld. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Time now for the final spread. The week ahead coming up, markets close on Monday for Labor Day, then durable goods and factory orders coming on Tuesday, ahead of the Fed's, Fed's beige book out on Wednesday. And then we have Fed speak picking up midweek with Collins, Harker, Bostic, Logan, and then we get another round of jobless claims. But it's probably that parade of Fed speak that you'll probably want to keep your eye on. From these people, of course, we've had so much economic data this week. Wall Street really divided on what this means for the Fed, both how much higher and for how long we stay at those high levels. But that's a question for next week, because from New York, that does it for us. Same time, same place next week. This is Bloomberg Real Yield, and this is Bloomberg.